Heaven's your home, and uh, it was uh, on a Tuesday afternoon in the McDonald's parking lot that Tula Seasway trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. It was a few weeks after that, as we continued doing discipleship lessons and going through the Bible, that he followed the Lord and believers' baptism. And uh, he, he came to me after the service and he said, Fundisi, which means pastor, he said, listen, I've got friends and family that need to know about this. When can we start something in Missionville? And I said, buddy, we can do that right now. And so God opened the door. We started meeting in Tulasizwe's home. And uh, the very first Bible study we had in his home, his mom and dad, uh, his uncle and his cousin, all four of them trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, the next week, we continued to grow. We were meeting on Wednesday afternoons. Uh, two of his uh, neighbors came, and they also trusted Christ. Uh, as we progressed through the Bible study, he started bringing other young men to the Bible study. Masipole and Raymond uh, are two young men that he met and invited them to come, and they trusted Jesus Christ. And so, all of these people that Raymond was, or excuse me, that Tula Sizwe was inviting into his home for our Bible study, they all started getting saved. And they, all, they were all faithful and continued to come back and, and hear the preaching of the Word of God. Oh, video's ready. All right, well, I'm going to let the video talk, and then we'll come back to the message. I met Tula Sizwe one afternoon as I was passing out invitations in the Missionville area. And he was uh, sitting in his house doing homework, which was very unusual for a guy his age. Most guys his age are out playing soccer or they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing and they're getting into trouble. But there was something different from the very beginning with Tula Sizwe. Tula Sizwe began attending church with us at Soweto Baptist and I would go by and pick him up. and. Uh, I would spend the afternoons with him after school just uh, teaching him the Bible and studying the Bible together. And uh, one afternoon we went to McDonald's to grab a cheeseburger and he looked at me and said, Fundisi, which means pastor, uh, I need to be saved. And so I was able to show him from the Word of God how he could know that when he died he went to heaven. And it was about three weeks after he trusted Christ that uh, he was uh, ready to follow the Lord's believer's baptism. After I baptized Tula Sizwe and we continued to do discipleship, uh, he looked at me and said, hey, listen, I've got friends and family that need to hear about this. When can we start something in Mission Bell? And I said, we can do that right now. We began meeting in his home on Wednesday afternoons. At the very first Bible study we had at Tula Sizwe's house, his mom and dad and uncle and cousin all trusted Christ as their Savior. And uh, these guys that he was bringing uh, all started getting saved. Uh, he met Raymond in the gym uh, before the Bible study and said, hey, I'm about to go to this Bible study. Come with me. Uh, he met Masinkale at school and told him about what was going on and invited him and he came. Things that might make you question whether or not you're, you're being effective or you're being used great enough, all those questions are out the window when I get to see a young man like Tula Sizwe investing himself in others. Seeing him with a passion and a burden to reach others with the gospel, it removes any doubt that God has me there and has him there for a purpose. And so that showed a little bit of uh, the video of there in his home where we were meeting uh, in the Bible study. Uh, the three young men that you saw there, those were the young men that went with me in that first, uh, that first time that we were knocking on doors. Uh, and um, one of the, the young men that was closest to me, uh, his name is Likaya, and he's faithfully serving the Lord. The young man that was in the middle next to him, next to Likaya, um, he reached that age where he, he decided that the world was more appealing to him, and so he's uh, left, left the church and left, uh, um, left basically all of his training that we've tried to invest in him. And the third young man, uh, his name is Awonke, uh, well, he, he, he is dead now. And he was 14 years old. Uh, Awonke was a young man that uh, got mixed up with a bad crowd. They had just got it, gotten back from um, their time in the bush, which is a ceremonial time, the rite of passage from boyhood into manhood. And Awonke, uh, being 14, he didn't get to go. And so all of his friends are sitting there in a, in a room, and one of, the, one of the guys looks at him and says, tell this boy that he can't be in here to get out. Well, Awonke got very upset about that. It was very uh, disrespectful and demeaning to call him a boy. And 
so he and this other guy got into an argument and the, the young man pulled a knife on Awonke and Awonke left. And then when Awonke came back later, he came back with a larger knife and he, and he stabbed and killed the young man. Uh, Awonke went and he turned himself into the police and the police said, well, we don't have room for you. Come back when you're 18 and we'll deal with you. <laughs> True story. Well, as time went on, uh, the young man that, uh, that died, his, uh, his family was seeking vengeance after Awonke and threatening his life. And Awonke was having a lot of restless, sleepless nights. He was eat up with guilt. And to hear his family, his lost family tell it, the ancestor, or excuse me, the spirit of the young man that he killed started visiting him in his sleep. And one night, Awonke got up from his bed and he tied a rope around his neck and he hung himself and he took his life. And I can tell you story after story of hundreds of Awonkes in South Africa that will never reach the age of 20. As a matter of fact, the average life expectancy among the Khosa people is 47 years old. And they have no hope outside of Jesus Christ. But because of your love and your investment, and God has changed the lives of so many. He's brought into our life a Tulasizwe who could have very much been like Awonke. And Tulasizwe is now bringing other men, other young people to our Bible study and our church services and they're getting saved. And that's all a result of your uh, sacrificial giving and support of our ministry. So thank you for being a part of that. Take your Bibles for just a few moments and turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. I'm going to be very brief. Yeah, you know, I love the book of Philippians. I, I had the, the privilege to preach through the book uh, in Tulsa, which was a challenge in and of itself. And so I took uh, the entire book and I would uh, do my lessons, my, my, my messages in English, and I would sit down with a, a, a Tulsa man and we would translate them together. And the goal eventually will be to where I can just think in Tulsa and not have to even touch English. Uh, but I'm not there yet, so pray with me about that. When we get back, we still have some more language learning to do. Uh, and uh, we're excited about that, but uh, I'm, I'm able to preach and teach in Tulsa as long as I have my notes with me. But I want to get to the point where just like I'm speaking to you right now, I don't even have to look at the notes. I can just preach. And so that's the goal of us learning Tulsa. But uh, uh, preach through the book of Philippians. And you know, I'll be honest, it became one of my favorite books. And I think one of the reasons is because it deals with my personal insecurities. And I know you're sitting there saying, well, you're a preacher. Preachers don't have insecurities. I'm just going to be honest with you tonight. Preachers are some of the most insecure people you'll ever meet. Ladies, I'm going to let you in on another secret. Men are some of the most insecure people you will ever meet. And do I hear any, any ladies say amen tonight? You know, the truth is, is that... <laughs> no, we don't hear that. <laughs> the truth is, is that God is still doing a work in me. And there are lessons that we see in the book of Philippians that I have to constantly be reminded of. Not just once a year, not just once a month, but oftentimes day by day. And Paul challenges us as he challenges the church there at Philippi uh, these lessons. In chapter 1, he, he talks about where he finds his identity. He says, listen, there's a group of men who are, they're trying to add bond, affliction to my bonds. I'm sitting in jail and they're trying to, to say bad things about me. He said, but I want you to understand whether they preach uh, Christ in pretense or in truth, I, I choose to rejoice and yea, will rejoice. He said, it doesn't matter what they say about me as long as they're preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. He goes on to say, he says, whether by, uh, uh, whether by, um, uh, my, my death or by my life, I just want Christ to be magnified in my body. He says, for to me to live is Christ. You know, a lot of people, they'll find their identity, they'll find their, their, their uh, place in this world and in this society by what they do or what they have. But Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. That's who he found his identity in. In chapter 2, he tells us what the mind of Christ is. And he also encourages us to have this mind. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I love this next word, wherefore. As a result of Jesus Christ leaving the throne of heaven, as a result of him humbling himself and being obedient unto death, as a result of his sacrificial life, wherefore, God has also highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can somebody say amen? amen. Aren't you glad that one day we'll stand before our Savior. And because we've confessed him Lord Jesus. It's going to be a wonderful day for us. But can I tell you the other side of that is that there is a world that is lost and they have not yet confessed Jesus Christ as Savior, but they will do so in the next life. They will bow the knee and they will confess with the tongue Jesus Christ. And that next moment they will slip into an eternal, literal burning hell. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Be the servant that God created you to be. Taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. In chapter 3, he gives us his spiritual resume. He says, listen, if there's anybody that has a right to brag as far as the world is concerned, it's I. He said, I was born to the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew among Hebrews. Uh, I persecuted the church concerning zeal. No one could touch me. If you were to look at my spiritual resume and I would turn it into the church, all churches would be fighting over who uh, me to be their pastor. I am the Apostle Paul. He said, but I counted all that but lost for the excellency of Christ. He said, yea, I counted it but done. He said, I, the, my greatest desire is this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, having fellowship with him even in his sufferings. You know, I stand amazed to dot. I stand amazed today that there's so many that would claim to be Christians and they don't have a problem worshiping Jesus as long as it's within the realms of their comfort zone. But I wonder how many of us tonight would want to have fellowship with Jesus even in his sufferings. You see, because in the sufferings of Christ, it may require your death. But that was Paul's desire that he would know Jesus Christ so intimately. That he had fellowship even in his sufferings. And then we come to chapter 4. In chapter 4, Paul is dealing with some issues here among two ladies. And he calls them out by name and he says, I beseech Yodius and I beseech Syntyche. He mentions their name. That they be of the same mind in the Lord. We don't know what they were arguing about, but they know that they, we, that they were not getting along. Maybe it was the color of the drapes on the windows. I don't know. If any of you ladies are not getting along, then understand, Pastor did not talk to me before the service. I have no idea. But Paul is dealing with two ladies who are not getting along. He says, you need to be of the same mind. But here in chapter 4, there's, there's three lessons that I want to point out to you that God has been working in my heart and oftentimes, day by day, has to continue to teach me. Begin reading with me. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odeus, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Then notice verse 4 with me. Rejoice in the Lord, and help me out with this next word, church. You know, that's pretty good, preacher. You know, one of the hardest things in the world is getting a bunch of Baptists to do anything at the same time. That was pretty good. Let's try that one more time. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, help me out. When is always? Always. Always. Very good. Pretty self-explanatory. What's another one? 
all the time, at all times. We are given the command to rejoice in the Lord always. It's pretty simple, right? You know, it's easy for us to rejoice in the Lord when everything's going our way. When the sun is shining and the birds are singing and there's a nice gentle breeze blowing outside. It's almost like one of the Disney movies where you have the birds delivering your clothes to you from the clothesline and they're draping it over your shoulder. It's easy for us during those times to rejoice in the Lord. But what, are we, what about when the storms of life happen? You see, when, when trials come into our life, it's not so easy for us to rejoice in the Lord, is it? Lesson number one tonight, control your thoughts or your thoughts will control you. Control your thoughts or your thoughts will control you. You see, for us to rejoice in the Lord at all times, regardless of circumstances, regardless of what we're going through, what we're dealing with, regardless of what we have or do not have, for us to rejoice in the Lord, we have to focus on His blessings and not our circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then He repeats Himself, and again, I say rejoice. You understand tonight that, that your attitude or your disposition in life, it's a direct reflection of your thought life. What are you feeding yourself or what you're feeding yourself, rather, is what will ultimately come out. Rejoice in the Lord always. So, and then he tells us how. Look at verse 5 with me. He says, let your moderation, your testimony, your disposition be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6, be careful for nothing. Stop worrying. If there are circumstances that you cannot change, then there's nothing you can do about it. We have to turn it over to God. It has to be in His hands. And we need to step back by faith and choose that today we may not like it, but we will rejoice in the Lord. Control your thoughts or your thoughts will control you. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So if we are to control our thoughts, then we have to understand that we are not to dwell on our circumstances. We're not to dwell on all the bad that we're going through, that we're facing. And we have to understand why there's trials that come into our life. James chapter 1 tells us this. It says, uh, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know what James says? He says it's the trying of your faith that makes you mature in, in your Christian life. It teaches you patience. It teaches you to be spiritually mature in the Lord. And it's the trying of our faith. We should count it joy. Control your thoughts or your thoughts will control you. So we don't focus on the bad, we don't focus on the storm, we focus on the Savior, but we look at verse 8 and it gives us this list of things that we can think on, that we can uh, put into our hearts and our minds, and it says things that are true and honest and just and lovely and of a good report, all of those things, that list there, it describes two things for me. Number one, it describes God's holy infallible word. You realize that right there in your laps and in your hands, you have the very words of life and of death. The Bible calls itself, it, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. All of the answers to the questions that you have in life can be found written in God's holy inspired word. The Bible says of itself that it's powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces even the dividing asunder of a man's soul and spirit. This Word of God is, is alive. 
And it can change hearts. And it can change minds. It can renew our minds that have been damaged, been damaged by sin, been damaged by the world. This word is powerful and it can change your life. We hold the words of life and of death that can take a, a soul that is lost on its way to a, 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 an eternal burning hell and see that soul saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ for all eternity, reunited with our Creator. We have a powerful Word of God. You know what, it, you know what else it describes to me? It describes my Savior. Isn't He altogether lovely? Isn't He wonderful? Isn't Jesus, isn't He the sunshine within our hearts? Isn't He the light of our life? Isn't He that cool drink of water in the midst of a storm? Jesus. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, Jesus Christ is the living incarnate of this holy inspired word you know how you control your thoughts tonight not by thinking about how bad things are not by thinking about what it is that you're going through or what you're dealing with but it's by looking to the God of heaven and thinking on things that are true and honest and just and lovely it's by thinking on his word and it's by thinking on Jesus Christ when I got back from Iraq in 2007, I, I struggled personally myself. I was a newlywed and my wife would like to sleep very close to me during that time and it only took a, a few times of this happening but I would wake up to the craziest thing. She would be hitting me in my sleep. I was asleep and here my wife is just going to town hitting me, trying to wake me up. What had happened was I had a nightmare in the night and I had taken my arm that was underneath her and I clenched up and I began to choke her in her sleep. I remember having these nightmares and they were terrifying. I remember there were a couple of times that I would jump straight up out of bed and I would look for my weapon in the corner. Of course, there wasn't a weapon there, but then I would go through the house making sure that each and every room was clear of any threat. My wife and I, we wanted to try to get some answers and try to get some help. And so we went and we talked to my pastor. And my pastor sat us down and uh, he, he said, Stephen, he said, I, what I want you to do is uh, at night before you go to bed, instead of watching TV, just take the next 30 minutes before you turn out the lights and go to sleep. He said, you and Ashley just read a chapter of the Bible together. And so we started doing that. Before long, a chapter turned into two chapters, and two chapters turned into four chapters, and my wife thought it was a good idea, and so she got a notebook, and we started keeping a journal of what we read, how it applied to our lives, and the decision that we would make as a result. You realize that within six months, my nightmares had all but ceased. The Word of God is powerful. And we were, when we replace... the our damaged hearts and our damaged minds, then we can have the renewing of our mind through His Word. Control your thoughts, or your thoughts will control you. Lesson number two tonight, and I'm done. Lesson number two. Expect nothing. Expect nothing. And be grateful for absolutely everything. Expect nothing. And be grateful for everything. Look with me at verse 10. Paul says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me had flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Amen. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. 
You see, we see athletes that take verse 13 and they like to put it under their eyes or they like to put it on their baseball bat. And so when they hit a home run, they say, well, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But you understand that that's not what verse 13 actually means. I can do all things through Christ. What is it talking about? It's talking about those things that he had just mentioned. I know how to live when I'm abased, when I'm low. And I know how to live when I abound, when, when everything's going right. I know how to live when I'm hungry, just as much as I know how to live when I've got plenty to eat. Paul's saying, listen, I have learned to enjoy uh, 20 cent ramen noodles just as much as I enjoy a T-bone steak from Longhorn. Can somebody say Amen. He said, because I have learned that my contentment, my joy does not come from what I have. It doesn't come from my circumstances, but my contentment and my joy comes from Jesus Christ. All those things that he said, I know how to live when I don't have anything as easily as I can live when I have everything. Because I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content because my source of strength is not of this world. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of so many different people who are facing hardships, going through hard times. And I think about the, the marvelous testimony of grace that they have. We have friends right now that their greatest desire is for them to get back into China so that they can continue to preach the gospel. They had to leave China and come back to the States for a short time because the police were looking for them. I heard testimony of, was it Brother Patenald that was rejected his visa to get into China? Pray with us about our visas. We're in the process of renewing ours. We should have an answer within the next couple of weeks. But we've seen missionaries that have been there for, in South Africa for 20 years that have recently been turned away. And there, there's no reason that, that we know of why. But I think of the, what they're having to deal with. Having their heart in this place that they want to serve, but they can't go because the door is closed. And, and I wonder sometimes, even as a missionary, if we don't find ourselves discontented because we're not getting to do that which we want to do. But see, our contentment doesn't come from geography. Our contentment doesn't come from our circumstances. Our contentment doesn't come from our possessions. Our contentment comes from Jesus Christ. When we look at the testimony of a man named Job, Job goes to bed one night and he's got the greatest life in the world. He's got a healthy family, his own health, he's wealthy, he's got all the riches of the land, and Job has everything. But Job goes to bed one night and then he wakes up the next morning and it's all gone. Job has those certain friends, and you know them, they'll come to you too in your time of need just to be a good blessing. And Job's friends come to him and he says, they say, well, if you hadn't have done this, then this wouldn't have happened. Or you should have done this, and this wouldn't have happened. But you know what Job's response to them was? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to leave you with this question tonight. If you woke up tomorrow, and Jesus was all you had, would Jesus be enough? You see, we don't find our contentment. We don't find our joy. We don't find our strength in the outward circumstances of life. We find it in the person of Jesus Christ. In whatsoever state I am, I have learned to be content. Not because I'm anything, but because Christ is everything. He's all I need. If you woke up tomorrow and everything was taken away, but you still had Jesus, would Jesus be enough? Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for this church and what they mean to our family. Lord, what they mean to our ministry. Lord, I thank you for Pastor and his... Uh, love for us and Lord his love for training the next generation 
Lord, I'm so thankful to see that there are young men that are being trained to carry the gospel to a lost and dying world. Continue to bless Faith Baptist Church. Continue to use this church to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me. Lord, to control my thoughts. Lord, help me to find my contentment, my joy in you. Lord, every breath that you give is a blessing from above. God, I pray, Lord, that I would never take it for granted. I love you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor.